So here's an interesting question on hypothesis testing. Consider the situation where you're tasked to investigate whether GM food has a negative health impact and you want to use hypothesis testing. The first task you then have is that you have to set up your hypothesis. Often when we do hypothesis testing, the null hypothesis will contain the case where we have no impact or no change. So in this example, the, the obvious choice for that would be uh, to specify as a null hypothesis that genetically modified food has no adverse health impact. The alternative then would obviously be that GM food has a negative impact or has an impact. I think very people say, I uh, think it may have a positive one. So let's look at our decision table where we uh, compare decision and truth. We divided the world into H0 and HA Okay, of course, the truth we don't know. We will never know whether we are in the H naught or H A world, but we will make a test decision. Now, if the truth is H naught and we decide in our test procedure H naught, then we are all good. If the truth is H A and our test rejects H naught, we are all good. But if the truth is H naught and we decide H A, we make a type one error. Inversely, this is a type two error. Type two error. Now these two situations, A and B, let's talk about these, well, what they entail in practice in this example. A, that's a situation where in fact GM food is safe, but since we reject the null that it is safe, we would possibly not approve it, say, for human consumption or even for animal food consumption. So it would be, so we would not use GM food although it was safe. So the consequences of that are potentially higher food prices, perhaps lower food production, and you know, you can, one could make a case that this may eventually lead to hunger and therefore quite severe consequences. What about situation B, type 2 error? That's where the truth is HA, but we decide H0. That's the situation where we would potentially approve GM food to be used, although there are health risks. The, the outcome here could be just the obvious one negative health effects on individuals or the population as a whole. So when you do hypothesis testing, you need to be aware of these two types of errors. Okay? And you need to keep in mind that it's only the probability of one of these errors which you can control and that's the probability that you make a type 1 error conditional on H0 being the truth. Well, of course we don't know where we'll be in that situation but the alpha, the significance level, that is the probability for the type 1 error and this can be controlled by the researcher. However, the probability for the type 2 error, that cannot be controlled. Okay, so that's if HA is true but we do not reject H0 in our testing procedure. In general, if you specify a lower type 1 error, that will result to a higher type 2 error. So when you set up your hypothesis, you need to, to figure out which of these two mistakes do I really want to control. In this case, you may think that you really want to control the the uh, situation B because of the negative health if effects that's sort of more immediate but don't forget that in situation A the impact could be you know famines in you know the worst case that may be a bit traumatic but just more hunger so it's not quite obvious so for the time being let's stick to using uh, H0 as GM food has no negative impact but in other situations you may switch your hypothesis around just to make sure that the type of error which is more crucial that this can be controlled and therefore it has to be a type, uh, the type 1 error. Now let us think about uh, sub-question 4, what sort of evidence would be needed for statistical conclusions. I just for the time being replicated our little decision table. We'll come back to that later. So I um, talk to our resident expert in attitudes to GM food, uh, Professor Dan Rigby, and some of what I say here is uh, comes from his experience. There are two types of pieces of evidence you may want to collect. The first one is sort of a longitudinal study where you follow people 
some with and some without exposure to GM food. Ideally, you have a randomized controlled trial where you allocate people into one of the two groups and then you, as you go along through time and exposure to whatever you're looking at here, GM food has or has not an effect, you will monitor health the health state and the illnesses of the people in the two groups and compare them. The second sort of evidence you may want to look at is what's called retrospective case control studies. Here you you find a group of people that uh, has some sort of health problem and then what you do is you, you find a comparison sample, something like a matched sample. So you want to find a group of people to compare your problem in inverted commas group. But you don't want any comparison group. You want a group that sort of matches in terms of age and demographics and perhaps other risk factors to the problem group. And then you find the sort of risk factors that predominantly exist in the group of people with the problems. Now, let's go back to the longitudinal study to see how we could use that here. The first issue is, you know, possibly using peoples isn't a, it's a no-go. People is a no-go area and, you know, randomized controlled trials with GM food is probably difficult. Also, exposure to GM food is difficult. What illness will we be looking at? There isn't really a specific illness we, we think GM may uh, cause. Now, that's the same problem as in a case control because here you're looking for specific illnesses. And the matching is a, is a sort of you know, more specific problems. So the, the retrospective case control possibly isn't, isn't the way to go here. So it's longitudinal studies, but since we can't use people, um, what people have used is they use animals and then they do sort of lab studies on animals which are fed with GM food and a control group without GM food. And then you look at the some sort of health indicators. So here's an example of such a study from Environmental International. And it's just a couple of things I want to point out here is that the, you know, the, there's basically been a demand to test GM food on animals to make sure it's safe for humans. Here's a table, table one here, that just summarizes a few of the existing studies. They're usually like on rats, 90 days, so it's longitudinal. So in this case, they found some sort of variations or differences between the animals that were fed GM time food compared to those who were not fed GM foods. And you can see there are different studies, uh, rats mostly, different sort of uh, periods over which they were monitored. I can go down rats, mice, broilers here, so chicken. And if you scan over the results, you will mostly find like no adverse effects, no significant differences. Uh, it was uh, concluded that the GM uh, food was safe and so forth. So the, the conclusion of this paper is that uh, you know, mainly the, the food seems to be safe, but they also uh, put, put in a note of caution indicating that many of these studies, if not most, are actually financed by biotech companies, the ones which actually market the food. So back to our question now to 1.5, how strong should the evidence be? Now, this really relates to our type 1 error. Okay, you need to understand what the type 1 error is to answer that question. So in our case, Given we had GM food is safe as H0, type 1 error is um, that in truth GM food is safe, but we reject it, and the probability of a type 1 error, given that H0 is true, is our significance level alpha. So this is what we control. And now it's important to understand that if that is in the control of the researcher, you may very well want to uh, deviate from the sort of standard 5%. So if A is considered to be very serious, a very serious consequence, then really you want a, a alpha to be as small as possible, you know, perhaps 0 0.0001. But if you do that, then you will need extremely strong or very strong evidence to reject the null hypothesis. So you need to be clear in your mind about how strongly or how much you want to avoid the occurrence of a type 1 error. 
and that will drive what value of alpha you set and therefore how strong the evidence will need to be to reject the null hypothesis.